So we start with a very interesting session uh, with uh, Gabriel Zuckman and then Ben Moll and Fatih Guvenen uh, will we'll discuss afterwards. So it's a somewhat unusual session because uh, each of the speakers will first have 25 minutes and then Fatih will have 30 minutes to discuss both papers and then the floor will be open for the questions. So we'll start uh, with Gabriel who will talk about the wealth inequality in the United States. This is a joint paper uh, with Emmanuel Saez and so uh, Gabriel is uh, now a professor at London School of Economics. Before that, he was a PhD candidate at the Paris uh, School of Economics, where he worked with um, Thomas Piketty, partly in collecting the data behind the famous book, The Capital. And so this is a research effort which goes in the same sort of line, in the same spirit, and uh, sort of talks more about uh, the experience in the US. So you have 25 minutes. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody, for being here, and thanks for having me at this conference. I'm very happy to present this work, which is joint work with Emmanuel Saez. And that starts from a puzzle, which is that we, we know that income inequality has increased a lot in, in the US. But the available evidence on the distribution of wealth uh, paints a mixed uh, picture. The survey of consumer finance in particular, which is a very good survey that oversamples the top of the distribution, shows a little bit of increase in wealth inequality, but not a lot. Uh, estate tax data that have been used for a very long time to study wealth inequality do not show any increase in wealth concentration at the top. So how is that possible? So one possible explanation is that rising inequality in the US is purely a labor income phenomenon. That is, maybe what's going on is that you have an upsurge in top wages and entrepreneurial incomes, but maybe these incomes you know, are not saved at a very high rate. Maybe you know, the working rich, they consume a lot, they don't save a lot. Or maybe they have low returns on their assets, they make bad investments. Or maybe you know, they pay a lot of taxes, you know, so we know that pre-tax, pre-transfer income inequality has increased, but maybe post-tax, post-transfer, not so much. So that's one possible explanation. Uh, another possible explanation is that it's, it's just, you know, that the available data fail to capture the increase in wealth concentration, and that's what I'm going to argue today. With Emmanuel, we developed or we implemented a, an alternative way to measure the distribution of wealth. We capitalized income tax returns data that exists since 1913 to capture wealth, and by doing this, we find that wealth inequality actually has increased tremendously over the last decades, and that's a very concentrated phenomenon. So the bulk of the action takes place at the very top of the distribution, in the top 0.1% of the distribution. So to fix ideas, to be part of the top 0.1% today, you need more than $20 million in total assets net of debts, okay, and the top 0.1%, that's about 160,000 families, uh, so with more than $20 million. So our goal and our starting point in this paper is the total amount of wealth in the flow of funds at the macro level. In some sense, what we are trying to do is simply to construct distributional flow of funds. The flow of funds, they report aggregates on wealth and investment, uh, but no data on distribution. So what we want to do is, okay, construct distributional flow of funds. That's a picture that shows the total amount of household wealth in the US divided by national income. As you can see, there is a marked U-shape uh, pattern uh, over the, the 20th century. One century ago, the wealth to income ratio was about four to five. So the US had the equivalent of four to five years of wealth uh, equivalent of four or five years of national income in wealth. And then the, the wealth to income ratio declined to about three in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and since the late 1970s has been rising to about 4.5 today. And so we are almost back to the high levels of you no know, wealth to income ratios of one century ago, but the, the composition of wealth has changed a lot, okay? One century ago, sole proprietorships and partnerships, mostly reflecting farm, land, you know, ag agricultural assets, were pretty big, whereas today they are much smaller, and pension wealth today is significantly uh, bigger. Okay, so what we want to do is allocate all of this wealth uh, 
to each existing family in the US. The way that we do this is that we capitalize income tax data. What does that mean? We start from each capital income component reported on individual income tax return. So dividends, interest, rents, uh, business profits, mortgage payments, capital gains, and so on. And then for each asset class, we compute an aggregate capitalization factor that simply maps the total flow of tax returns income to the total amount of wealth in the flow of funds. So for instance, if there is $10 trillion of fixed income wealth in the flow of funds and $500 billion of interest income in tax data, then the capitalization factor for fixed income wealth is 20, okay? And we are going to multiply at the individual level each capital income component by component by the correct, by, by the capitalization, by, cor by the corresponding capitalization factor, okay? So that's a very simple idea, but you know, first of all, you need a lot of care in reconciling the wealth of the flow of funds and the income from tax returns. And second, well, that's a method that relies on one key assumption, which is that within each asset class, each group, on, on average, each group of the wealth distribution on average has the same capitalization factor, okay? So that's really the key thing. You know, is that, is that a good assumption? What, what do we know about that? Evidence that we have suggests that indeed within asset class, realized rates of returns do not systematically vary with wealth. And you know, that was far from you know, clear on, 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 an a priori, on a priori grounds, right? Because in principle, you can imagine that you know, the rich, maybe they have higher equity or bond returns, maybe because they're better at putting good investment opportunities. In that case, if that was true, there would be a level bias in our estimates, right? We would overestimate the very top wealth shares. Another issue, and maybe a bigger issue is that maybe this potential differential in rates of returns has increased since 1970s. You know, maybe financial innovation and, and globalization uh, benefits the wealthy more than the rest of the population in the sense that it might allow uh, very rich individuals to get higher returns than, than average within asset class. So if that was true, uh, there would be a trend bias in our estimates. We, will, we would overestimate uh, the increase in uh, the top wealth shares. <coughs> now, we do have three tests that show that within asset class, realized rates of returns do not systematically vary with wealth. So uh, the first test is foundations. U.S. foundations, they are required to report on both their assets and their income to the IRS. And so you have publicly available data on the IRS website on foundation wealth and foundation income. And so you can look at, you know, the rates of returns of foundations and you can try to capitalize foundations income and see whether you're able to reproduce the correct distribution of foundation wealth. And so we do this test and we show that uh, we are indeed, the capitalization method indeed works well for foundations. So there's a, a little trick, you know, a little subtlety to this. Total rates of returns, they rise with wealth. For foundations, that's very striking. The bigger the foundation wealth, the higher the return on assets. Now, it turns out that a small part of this comes from purely composition effects that no richer foundations have more equities and that this generates higher returns in the long run. And so that's not a problem for our method since you no know, our capitalization factors vary by asset class. And the second and the key reason why total rates of returns rise with wealth for foundations is that unrealized capital gains, the rate of unrealized capital gains rises with wealth. Okay, but realized rates of returns, when you take the realized capital gains only of foundations and not their unrealized returns, uh, 
these are the same across the distribution of foundation wealth. And that's the reason why when you capitalize foundation income, you find the correct distribution of foundation wealth. And that's all we need for our purposes. Now, what we need, the key assumption that we need is that realized rates of returns are flat uh, within asset class, okay? And that can be consistent with total rates of returns rising with wealth. So that's one test. Second <coughs> test is uh, matched estate and income tax data. So you look at people who died, for instance, in 2010, and you match them to their 2009 individual income tax return. And so you can look at the return that these people had on their equities, on their bonds, and so on. And we find that the returns are the same across the distribution of wealth at death. So at the individual level, there's a lot of heterogeneity in returns, right? The, the, the relationship between wealth and income at the individual level is very noisy. But the whole point of this exercise is when you take averages within groups, like the top 0.1 or the top 1 or the next 4%, then on average, the within asset class returns are the same. And we <laughs> see that in estate tax data. And the last and most important test is the survey of consumer finances, the SCF. In the SCF, people are asked to report on both their income as reported on their tax return. So one question in the SCF is, what's the amount of dividends that you put in line 9A of your 1040? So people, you know, respondents you know, give answers about this, and they are asked about wealth. So you can check that by capitalizing the income of SCF respondents, you do generate the correct distribution of SCF wealth. Okay, and so we've, we've checked that that's, that's true. So presumably, the capitalization method, you know, makes sense, especially in the US where there's a lot of income that flows to individual income tax returns, right? All the income earned through mutual funds in particular are immediately taxable, you know, immediately appear on your 1040, which is not the case in many countries. In, many, in France, for instance, where I come from, if I invest in a mutual fund, the mutual fund earns dividends and interest, that's not going to appear on my tax return. So the capitalization method, you know, in those countries would probably not work, not work as well. Now, let me, however, stress that I believe that the capitalization method is the best way today to estimate the wealth distribution in the US because it uses the best and the most comprehensive available administrative data. But you know, this is far from perfect, right? This is far from perfect. And you know, there are, there are uncertainties about what, what's happening to wealth inequality uh, in the US. Now, the second potential problem with the capitalization method is that there's a lot of wealth that does not generate taxable income. So let me go quickly on this because it turns out it's not very important. What is it? It's owner-occupied housing and pension wealth, which is big on aggregate, but which is not very big at the top, right? So we do account for this. You know, we allocate housing wealth proportionally to uh, uh, property taxes paid, which are itemized on tax return. For pension wealth, part of it we do observe because it's reported to the IRS, so mostly all the wealth on individual retirement accounts. All of this is not very important for what's happening at the top, just because pension wealth and, and owner-occupied housing at the top is only a small fraction of wealth. The important point is that each year we do cover 100% of the total amount of wealth in the flow of funds. So what do we see? What are the results? That's, the, what, that's what we find for the time evolution of the top 0.1% wealth share. So one century ago, it was about 20%. 20, 20 then it declined enormously during the Great Depression and World War II. And then you have this remarkable period of stability in the 1950s, 60s, early 70s, where the top 0.1% wealth share is about 10%. The late 1970s are a very bad decade for the very wealthy, in particular because equity markets uh, are very low. And since the late 1970s, you've had this gradual and quite spectacular recovery all the way back, or almost all the way back to the high levels of wealth concentration observed one century ago. Now, the second result is that What's going on today, you really have to pay attention to the very top. That's a graph that decomposes the top 1% wealth share into four groups. So the gray curve 
top one to top 0.5. Okay, that's the share of wealth of people between the top one and the top 0.5 percent of the wealth distribution. That's been remarkably constant since 1960, about 8 percent of total wealth. Then you can look at the next 0.4 percent, the black curve, people between the top 0.5 and the top 0.1 percent. There is a tiny increase in their share of wealth. But really, all the action is in the you know, blue and red curve, blue between top 0.1 and top 0.01 percent. And you know, the top 0.01 percent wealth share, uh, so people with more than uh, 100 million dollars today net wealth, this group has experienced a, 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 a spectacular increase in its share of total wealth from about 2% in the late 1970s to close to 12% uh, today. Now, let's try to think about the mechanisms, you know, what's, what's going on? How can we explain this increase in wealth uh, concentration? That's a graph that shows what's happening to the income of top wealth holders. So the starting point of all this is there's been a lot of, there's, there's been an increase in income inequality. And one way to see this is to look at this, the income of top 0.1% uh, wealth holders. If you look at their total income, you know, both labor income and capital income, so that's the, the black curve here, they, the top 0.1% wealth holders, they had about 3% of total income in the 70s. Now they have about 8% of total income. The bulk of this increase, at least all of this increase up to the mid or to the late 1990s is due to the increase of the labor income of rich people. Okay, so look at the labor income curve. In 1960s, top 0.1% wealth holders, they, they have about 0.3% of total labor income in the economy. So to put it differently, they have the equivalent of three times the average wage. Okay, that's in 1960s. In the late 1990s, they have almost 4% of total labor income in the economy, so the equivalent of 40 times the average wage. Okay? So there's been a huge increase in the wage income, the labor income of top wealth holders. So the starting point is this, an upsurge of labor income at the top. The second step is this labor income has been saved at a very high rate. So that's a graph that decomposes, you know, that, that shows saving rates uh, by, wealth, uh, by wealth groups. And these are decennial uh, averages. What this shows is that, you know, generally speaking, saving rates tend to rise with wealth. But the heterogeneity in saving rates has increased enormously since 1980s. Uh, we knew before the crisis that the private saving rate, in particular the household saving rate in the US uh, was falling. And so many people were saying, well, we know that there's rising income inequality, but we see a falling and very low saving rate. So, you know, presumably these uh, working rich, they are consuming a lot. You know, they are not saving a lot, otherwise we would see aggregate saving rise. And so, you know, let's not worry too much about wealth inequality. And by the way, that's consistent with what survey data show. Now, I think all of this just misses the point, which is that, yes, the aggregate saving rate was falling, but it was mostly, and it was entirely because of the fall of the saving rate of the bottom 90% and even of the next 9%. But for the top 1%, the saving rate actually has not fallen in any measurable way, and it's still about 35% of income. So you see you have an upsurge in top wages, very high saving rates at the top, so just a snowball effect, you know, a lot of wealth is being accumulated at the top, and then this wealth generates a sizable return. So that's a graph that shows the average rate of return on wealth in the US, so the black curve is just the total flow of capital income divided by the total amount of wealth, so that's the average rate of return on wealth in the US, and you see, you know, that's about 7% today, and you know the dotted line is adding price effects, capital gains and capital losses and equities and housing and so on, it's very volatile. But the point is that, you know, average rates of returns, 
and probably even more so rates of returns at the top are pretty big, which is not a surprise. You know, the capital share of income is very big and, and you know, it's rising and, you know, wealth is, uh, you know, is rising a little bit, you know, at roughly the same rate as the capital share. So the rate of return, the average rate of return has to remain, you know, roughly stable and pretty, and pretty high. So this wealth generates a lot of return. So that means that, you know, now the top wealth holders in, top, in, in addition to having a lot of labor income, they also have a lot of capital income. And so their share of total income is rising today, not because their share of labor income is rising, but because their share of capital income is rising. So that's what this graph here shows for the post-1995 period. Now, let, let me uh, finish with what's happening uh, at the bottom. So that, that's just zooming on the bottom 90% curve here. The bottom 90% curve here is decennial averages. Now let's look at yearly data for the bottom 90% saving rate since 1975. In the 70s, 80s, the saving rate you know, was about 5%. There was some volatility. But what's really striking in this graph is that you have this 10 years period before the financial crisis of negative saving for the bottom 90%. And we are talking large negative saving rates, you know, minus five, minus six, up to minus 8% in 2006, right? And that's something that you could not see with the, the currently available data, right? The national accounts are mostly or only about aggregates you see a fall in the price saving rate, but you can't tell whether it's the bottom 90% or everybody who's saving less. Now, what we see is this massive this saving for uh, the, the vast majority of the population. And that has played a big role in, of course, the dynamic of the real wealth of the bottom 90%. That's, that's a graph that compares the average real wealth of the bottom 90% on the right axis, so about $80,000 today to the real average wealth of the top 1% on the left axis. So that's about you know, $14 million today. And what's striking is that the real average wealth of the bottom 90% is no higher today than it was in 1986. For a small period of time, you know, during the housing bubble, that was not true. But it turns out that you know, that was very temporary. And with the crash in housing prices, now have average bottom 90% wealth is back to where it, where it was almost 30 years ago. And that's the last graph. The consequence of this is that the share of wealth owned by the middle class, the bottom 90%, you know, the, the bottom half of the distribution always have has very little wealth, you know, between zero and five percent. So you can interpret the bottom ninety percent as, you know, people between the median and the top, the top ten, the middle class. Let's say their share of wealth for a long time increased, you know, from the nineteen thirties to nineteen to the early nineteen eighties, uh, from a low of fifteen percent in nineteen thirties to more than thirty five percent. And so there is this widespread view that that one key structural change in the U.S. You know, today compared to one century ago is the rise of middle class wealth. There's a lot of pension wealth. There's a lot of housing, uh, uh, the rates of, you know, so there's a lot of it. But certainly that story was true up to the early 1980s. But since the uh, early 1980s, the bottom 90% wealth share has declined a lot. To the extent that today, yes, the bottom 90% has a lot of pension wealth. But basically, it has nothing else in the sense that housing net of mortgage debt is pretty small. Equities and fixed income claims net of non-mortgage debt, consumer credit loans, you know, auto loans, student loans, and so on, is basically uh, zero. So let me conclude. What, what we've tried to do in this paper, the first step in a, in a broader agenda, which is uh, to create distributional uh, national accounts, so DINA in short. Uh, today's national accounts are only about aggregates. 
The way that we study inequality today is by using survey or tax data that contain information about distributions, but, are, but, are, but which are widely inconsistent with macro totals, okay? The total flow of income, for instance, that you see in tax data is only 60% of total national income. The total consumption that you see in the CEX is only 30 to 40% of total consumption in the national accounts. So it's very, the next step, you know, I think in this, in the study of inequality, at least from an empirical perspective, is well, we started using surveys, and that's fine, you know, surveys have limitations, but they are useful. Then we use tax data, and that's a progress, that's a small progress compared to surveys, you know, in particular because you have less problems of under-reporting at the top. The next step is to uh, bridge the gap between microdata surveys and tax returns on the one hand and macro aggregates. That's what we've tried to do with, with Emmanuel for wealth in that paper. And now we are trying to do this uh, in the US for income. So constructing uh, distributions of total national income in the US, $15 trillion today. Uh, so consistent with macro aggregates and consistent with the patterns, the distributional patterns that uh, we see in tax and uh, survey data. Thank you very much.